so today's icebreaker question is as usual personal to me so i recently got a playstation 5 like just last saturday uh, and i want to know which is your favorite game or if you're not into video games which is your favorite sport because i am an avid sports person i used to play football a lot uh, and i'm trying to get back into sports so if not video games which is your favorite sport just let me know in the chat i am really excited to see what you folks love fortnite paintball martial arts wow these are okay the the chat is just popping up for me so it's really difficult to catch up with everything uh let's see chess cycling then chess also gets a plus one uh roller coaster tycoon or grown up okay spinning wow okay this is this is really really interesting and wow now i honestly cannot differentiate which of these are video games and which of these are not because chess you can play on the video game as well as you can play with your friends uh but it's really exciting to see uh all these wonderful suggestions coming in yes max i i agree on that that paint ball is a blast all right uh i am going to leave this question open for everyone to you know answer and you know just break the ice and kind of introduce yourself to each other uh and while you do that i am going to go ahead and give you a quick idea of what the agenda looks like so we already went through the housekeeping rules once again for those who just joined in the meet up is being recorded so if you are not comfortable feel free to turn off your webcam if you have any questions ask them in the chat i am continuously monitoring the chat and i am going to ask your questions uh, to our speakers in the q and a session and then be respectful and mindful of what you share today all right so taking a look at the agenda as usual we got product updates from none other than max and there are so many new features that are coming up that we are excited to share with you all next we got west lambert who works as a principal engineer at security union solutions west will talk about applying automation to security use cases with anatan which is something interesting and i am really looking forward to and lastly no meetup is complete without a talk from jason so we got jason joining in to share some tips on how to keep your sec of team sane and after this we'll have a quick q and a well again i am going to ask your questions to the speakers and then we'll have a small networking activity all right uh it takes a lot of time and effort to design new features and max knows it well but when max is working on these features i am sure all he dreams of about is coming on this meetup and sharing it with you all uh so for, without further ado uh, handing it over to max to share product updates with us all take it over max thanks so much harsh for the warm introduction as always let me just share my screen here we can get stuck into it um does everyone see a slide check we're going to go with i see some thumbs up okay so it's april hi everyone another month uh very excited to share what we've all been working on in the last month um i'd also like to take a quick moment to thank all of my amazing colleagues and our passionate community uh today i'm celebrating my 2 year anniversary and it and and it feels like we're just getting started um but on that note let's dig into some fun stuff um so the first thing i want to give you an update about is the no details view that we teased i think in the last meetup so um the no details view this is the view when you have a node open and you're configuring its settings um we're releasing this refactor in a few different tranches um the first one actually came out in the last and it and release um overall across all the tranches our goals are to make 
this experience more intuitive, clean, and professional. And we also want to reinforce this concept that nodes accept input data, you manipulate that data and then output that data. So we're seeing here, this is the version that's out now, but we can see that metaphor being reinforced. We have the input pane, you set up some step, the data goes through that input pane and it goes out the other side to the output. Um, but one of the big things that we want to do for existing users is reduce the context switching you have to do between the canvas. Um, because of this input pane here, you'll be able to see the immediate data flowing into this node. It's also a drop down to select data early in your flow. Um, and um, this also will tease some exciting things that we want to do with data mapping. We envision folks are going to be able to drag and drop parameters onto or drag and drop data from the input pane onto the parameters pane. That'll be something that comes out after this feature's out. Um, so the first transcript's out now. Um, there's a, a look and feel update. It's also laying the foundation for a lot of the upcoming stuff. So you might not feel a whole lot of new functionality, but we're laying the groundwork for, for this stuff that you're seeing here. Um, what it does add, there's a sticky table header if you're used to using the table view. Um, so the header stays as you scroll past lots of data. There's improved UX for output branches. And uh, I can give you a quick demo of that if you haven't had a chance to update your edit end instance yet. Um, so just quickly do that. So in this very simple workflow, if I open up the function node here, um, we can see that we've got this new style output pane. Um, if I were actually to constrain my viewport quickly here, we can see, just one second, um, when I make this shorter, you can see that we've got the sticky header there. There's also an update to the JSON view, um, et cetera. Um, so again, this is just the, the foundation that we're laying. Um, in the if node, you can see there's a bit of refactor as well on how we treat input and output branches and a few other um, basically polishments and whatnot. Um, but I think what we're all really excited about is this next tranche that's coming out that's going to add in this input pane for various user testing and whatnot. We saw that it really did help folks not have to context switch. Um, so this is a, a quick preview of it. In Figma, we'll give you a little behind the scenes as well of what we're expecting to add with the input pane. Um, but that will have um, various empty states improvements for existing users. You might not see as much benefit from that if you already know how to use it. We envision this is going to help newcomers. Um, but how we envision this working is that um, you have the center panel, you have your inputs and your outputs. And from time to time, depending on the context, you will be able to adjust this parameters pane to grow and shrink the input and output panels. So if you have a look here, a little behind the scenes sneak peek, we can see the interaction pattern where when hovering on the parameters pane, you have this guy here, and you can actually adjust that to grow and shrink those panes. So um, this is gonna be the initial version of this refactor. Obviously there'll be a lot more coming down the line. The second tranche we've already started on now that the first one's out. And then the third tranche will be a smaller one, collection of other tweaks and stuff that we basically didn't wanna delay um, releasing outputs, uh, the input pane on. So that's gonna be coming down the line pretty soon here. Um, the next, feature that we've been busy on, our work for Canvas notes. So this is something that we get a tease of um, in the previous meetup. Um, I'll be candid, we hope to already release this feature. Um, but there was quite a bit of complexity around the interaction patterns, since it's something that's happening on the Canvas, and there's actually a lot of really functionality, interactions, keyboard shortcuts, that sort of thing on the Canvas. Um, so we basically just need a bit more time on a few revisions to make sure it's a high quality V1. Um, I don't want to put a firm date on this, um, but I would anticipate that it will be out in April. Um, so uh, do watch the space for that. Um, for those of you who weren't on the last meetup, this will allow you to leave notes in your flow. In this example, we can see it could be things like a very small little note. It could be something like a setup guide. If you're sharing workflow templates internally or in the community, and we also have designed it um, some sort of rules in the, in the Z index or, or where it uh, is rendered on the canvas. You can also use it for containers to sort of group processes um, to make it a bit more understandable for other people. Um, it does support markdown from V1. So as you can see here, um, numbered and, and unordered lists, titles, links, 
emojis, that sort of thing is supported. We're using Markdown Library, so there's a lot of other stuff that will also likely be supported out of the box. Um, like any feature, once this is out, if there's things that you would like for it, you know, we do have an official post when the feature's out on the community forums. Do please uh, get chatty in there. Um, the next thing, this is maybe a bit of a smaller feature, but one I'm excited about nonetheless, um, we're going to be releasing dragging and dropping um, nodes from the nodes panel. So something we notice in a lot of user tests is folks, when they use an identifier for the first time, they try to drag and drop um, from the nodes panel, and we don't currently support that. So this is a little sort of nice to have thing that we've been passionate about putting on the board. Uh, we've got some new joiners, some new front end joiners. So this is one of the tasks that they're knocking out. Um, it's a small improvement. I expect it will be out in the next release or the one thereafter. We're just polishing up and shoring up a few edge cases that are browser specific. Um, the next feature um, is a little update on our public API. We teased this in the last um, meetup. And so just as a little update on where that's at, the first resource is almost done. It's the users resource. So this will allow you to programmatically manage users, creating them, updating them, deleting them. Um, as you can imagine, to get the first resource sort of working, there was a lot of scaffolding needed to get it ready, like authentication. So we expect that adding more resources should be a lot faster than this first one. I don't have a formal ETA on this, um, but we're making great progress. There's a lot of interest for this feature. Again, the scaffolding is all set up. So I expect it um, to be out sooner than later, the V1 there. Um, as we usually do, we don't want to hold back functionality and, and have it sit privately. So we likely will release that in tranches having some of the most important re resources out, collecting your feedback, and then releasing out further coverage um, thereafter. Um, so after the public API, another feature we're really excited about that we've got some traction on already is our community node repository. Um, so the idea behind this feature is that node creators um, out in the community will be able to submit their custom NNN node packages to the NPM public registry. Um, and then we're going to ship an in-app feature. This is a, an example of it here. Excuse me. That will allow users to install these packages via the UI. So you don't have to be a system admin or get your hands dirty in terminal. It will also let you update and remove um, these packages via the UI. So the goal of this feature is twofold. Um, the first one is, you know, we do get feedback that our PR count in GitHub is relatively high. We actually have a team working to chip away at that because we do really appreciate when you contribute. And we see the community node repo is gonna be another way to alleviate some of that pressure. You know, when you have a useful utility node, or maybe you have some nodes that aren't quite meeting the, the UX uh, standards or something to be put into the core repo. You now have this opportunity where they can be pushed here, you can get feedback on them. Um, and perhaps in the future, those could be ingested into NAM. Um, but this is also a step to sort of democratize this because just because some node doesn't meet the stringent criteria we might have doesn't mean that it might not be valuable for some community members. Um, so we expect that this is going to allow you to share. Um, there are some private nodes that we've seen some of you have, and um, we really hope that you will contribute to this if you have any cool nodes sitting around. Um, the design for this feature is finished. Backend is almost finished. Um, we expect the front end to move relatively quickly as we're starting to see the benefits of the NADN design system that you're seeing in certain parts of the app being rolled out. Um, so when this feature is closer to being ready, we'll be posting um, on the community forums and probably on various channels, asking for you to upload your custom node packages if you have them, we'll also have some docs on how to do that. Um, so watch this space if you have some useful ones. Um, I know some of you do. I've gotten your emails and they seem really cool and we're excited um, for the global community to be able to use them soon. Um, so. That's the list of uh, stuff that we're sharing. As I always uh, say, this isn't everything that we're working on. It's just the sort of a scoop off the top. Um, and if you have any feedback on what you'd like to see in these product updates, more behind the scenes stuff, um, more in-depth on features that are out, please do let me know. You can reach me at Twitter at max to catch it's M-A-X-T-K-A-C-Z, or max at N-A-N.io. Um, before I close up here, um, as always, I just want to thank our whole team for their hard work on all of this stuff. You know, I get the privilege of sharing these updates, but it's a lot of talented and motivated folks who bring this all to fruition. Um, I would say probably one of my, the, the biggest pleasures of my job is, you know, you, you were over in pixel land and then you get the, the ping from an engineer that it's ready for review. 
you get to check it out and you get to see your work come alive. So thanks to every one of my colleagues and our community members for making these features, well, realizing them and also the feedback that makes them actually helpful. So thanks to all of you. All right. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, I can already see the ex excitement about these features in the chat, and there are a lot of questions for you, which I'm going to ask uh, in the Q&A session. But once again, thank you for sharing the update. Again, a quick reminder for you all, I am collecting your questions and will be asking them in the Q&A. So if you have any questions for Max, don't forget to share them in the chat. Moving forward, our next speaker, Wes Lambert is a principal engineer at Security Union Solutions, where he helps companies to implement enterprise security monitoring solutions and better understand their computer networks. West loves to solve problems and, enha and enhance organizational security. And in today's talk, West is going to walk us through several ideas and give us an example implementation to get the wheels turning for analysts and engineers. Over to you, West. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Give me just a second here to share my screen. Can you see me okay, Arshil? All right. Yes. Uh, let's see. Let's have another. Step two. Share. Okay. Just let me know if you're good with that, and then I'll go ahead. All yeah, right. we can see your screen. All right. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Wes Lambert. I uh, just wanted to talk to you guys today about uh, just some ways in which you can start thinking about how to automate security use cases if you aren't already. Uh, just some simple kind of ways to get started with NADN and, and what types of nodes you might use and, and that sort of thing. So uh, continuing with that, um, I am a husband to an amazing, beautiful wife and father of four crazy kids. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a principal engineer at Security Engine Solutions, um, where uh, we have an enterprise security monitoring platform that is free and open that we help folks to implement, and uh, we maintain that there at Security and In Solutions, uh, Security and In. And uh, I have about 10 years, a little over 10 years of experience in IT and information security, uh, kind of in that same discipline, in that same vein, uh, and really enjoy building those solutions that help security analysts and engineers work smarter. Uh, you know, more efficiently and not harder. So that's that's what I kind of want to get folks thinking about today. Uh, and really, you know, when we think about security and, and you know, we hear about it all the time about, uh, you know, these, these threats and these breaches and everything else. Um, as a blue teamer, um, security can be hard, right? I mean, there are a lot of different areas uh, like compliance, um, you know, a lot of different technical controls, right? Um, just different things. I mean, the whole discipline is, is huge and there are so many things to think of. And, um, you know, as a blue teamer, it's often said that, you know, we have to think of all the ways that uh, bad guys can break in and they just have to find a one way to break in, right? Um, so it, it can definitely be hard. And, uh, you know, the fact that there are these secure coding methodologies and uh, practices that are in place, um, these don't always necessarily equate to secure software, right? Um, and these next generation firewalls, um, just having one in place does not necessarily mean that you have next level uh, enterprise security. Um, there are always going to be gaps and vulnerabilities, right? Bad guys are always going to be finding ways to get in, to poke at the software and, and find these little holes. And, um, you know, there are always going to be those bad guys or, or even just people playing around and, and uh, having opportunistic, um, you know, fun with your um, with your attack surface. So um, again, security is hard and, and you know, we just have to keep that in mind and, and keep in mind that there, we're always gonna have to keep at it. Um, you know, there's never really gonna be a stopping point. Uh, and the solution, right? So what, what is the solution? Uh, again, there's, there's no silver bullet, right? No one size fits all approach. Uh, everybody's enterprise is different. Everybody's attack surface and threat model is different. Uh, and really the most important thing here is to be able to, no matter what your resources, uh, you know, a lot of times folks, uh, you know, today or businesses today, uh, they may not have that many uh, people on their security team. They might not have a dedicated security team. So 
we have to be able to scale these operations, these folks that are in these roles. Um, we have to be able to scale analysis and scale response and be able to do that efficiently and effectively, right? So that's that's one of the goals of, of what I want to talk about today. Um, and the overall goals, I think, with these, you know, these folks and these teams really, uh, first and foremost, to reduce that alert fatigue, right? So there may be, um, you know, aside from tuning, there may be hundreds or thousands or, you know, maybe even millions of alerts uh, in some alert queue that an analyst is going to be investigating on, on a regular daily basis. Um, we want to try to automate that and, and really reduce that fatigue and, and try to, you know, make things more efficient where we can. And in doing so, really focusing on those tasks that are repetitively uh, performed or, you know, performed day in, day out again and again by analysts. Uh, that don't really make sense for them to keep doing, you know, going off and clicking and, and kind of doing the same thing to arrive at maybe a, a yes or no or um, some kind of answer that can be selected from a box, right? Like, um, we don't want to eliminate the analyst either, right? So we want to keep the analyst in the equation. We need that human factor, right? Machines aren't the best at everything. We need that human uh, you know, that cognitive ability, that ability to discern given certain context. And that's what's really important here is, is providing a lot of context to an analyst more quickly so they can come to a decision around an investigation, uh, you know, more quickly and, and resolve that investigation with that alert. Uh, so that's really the goal here to increase the amount of context available and to do it quickly, right? Empower the analyst. So one common use case here, uh, and I'm going to be going through these kind of quickly because I've got a little bit to cover here. Um, it's going to be uh, initial alert triage, right, or reputation check. Uh, typically, an analyst might be sifting through an alert queue, going through some IDS alerts or other types of alerts from a security system, right? Um, so one of the things that we might want to do is, is pull the system for new alerts or maybe send a notification if we get a new alert um, you know, from a certain security system. Maybe it's an IDS, maybe it's uh, you know, a network-based IDS, or maybe it's a host-based IDS intrusion detection system. Uh, maybe it meets a th certain threshold, right? Uh, maybe we want to query virus total for it and see if it has any context available for us, or maybe some other, other source of information, maybe some internal data, some repository that we have and maybe we want to send an external alert, right? Or some sort of notification if it exceeds that threshold or it matches some value. This is you know, one of those use cases that we might want to look into to help analysts get that context more quickly and uh, be able to resolve that investigation and that alert more quickly, right? Focus on the things that matter and make the best use of their time. So in doing that, uh, here's a simple example workflow. I, I don't have a link for it here, but I can definitely produce that later. But uh, again, to get a feel of what you might use here, you might use something like an interval trigger um, to basically perform that polling at an interval. And there may be a better way to do this. Uh, I'm certainly not an, an expert. So, um, but that's one way is using the interval trigger, say every minute or every 30 seconds or every 10 seconds to poll. If you have an Elasticsearch database where your IDS or host-based intrusion detection alerts are or housed or other types of alerts, a SIM, uh, we can query that. Uh, and then we can use that, you know, we can use the HTTP node to query that and then transform that data uh, with that function node. And then uh, if we need to submit that data, however it's transformed, we can submit that to VirusTotal, we can submit that to, you know, some internal repo. And then we can come to some determination more quickly. And we can even chain these events together, right? So if we don't really know that this is you know, potentially malicious yet, we can kind of shift these around because this is a very contrived use case. Um, but we can continue chaining those outputs and, and building that, that context, right? And then so based on that switch node, if we feel like it's not necessarily malicious or something that we're deeming noteworthy right now, we can acknowledge or dismiss the alert. Right, um, and then we can send an email if we do feel like that's something that we want to investigate further. Or maybe it's Slack, or you know, maybe it's Discord, um, or you know, it's some additional piece of information. Uh, we could use an HTTP node to add on to that alert, right? To tack on additional details uh, back into the sim or back into that that data platform. Uh, so that 
that might be one way that you can achieve that, right? Again, a very simple example, um, but just a way kind of to get started thinking about how you might chain that together and, and produce the results that you're looking for. <clears throat> Excuse me, get some water real quick. Now, continuing on from use case one, another use case, and, and I'm sorry, so let me say, um, let me back up a little bit. So one repository uh, here, like if you're running security in, so um, you know, I work for security and solutions, obviously, um, but that, that might be an example here. I, I realized I just forgot to go back and address this, but uh, security in would ho house both those host base and IDS based alerts and other types of alerts and data that you can kind of uh, you know, pivot from there if you want to work from that, that workflow. But going forward, if you want to use something like an EDR platform, or uh, you know, something like an endpoint visibility tool, maybe we have a use case where we want to search all of our hosts across our enterprise that are enrolled in that platform uh, for a particular IOC, right? Maybe we've gone through and we have an alert and uh, we've investigated that alert to a certain degree on one host and we found this malicious executable or this file or whatever. Um, what if we want to search all other hosts and see if it's present there? Uh, you know, um, what's a quick, easy way to do that? Uh, well, we can do that in somewhat automated fashion if we want to, right? So we could indicate this observable as an IOC in something like Security NN or another case management platform. Uh, we can have something watching, right? Um, if that particular platform has the ability to send to a webhook, we can do that and send to the webhook trigger, or we can use that HTTP polling input again. Um, and we can also, again, route the observable if it's a hash or a file name. We can route that based on the type, and then we can perform a call to you know, some EDR platform to search that fit of host for that particular IOC, right? And maybe if an IOC is found in that box, maybe something that we know to be malicious, we want that host to be quarantined right away, right? We want to cut off access to maybe if it's you know, trying to perform C2 and XFIL data, we want to cut off that communication and really only be able to connect to it from that endpoint or that EDR platform. So that might be something we want to do as well. <clears throat> so an example of that would be, again, I mentioned if that case management platform supports sending notifications to webhook, we can use the webhook trigger here and in it in, and that switch node to route by observable type. So if it's a hash, then we can go over here to the hash hunt and for Velociraptor, for example, our EDR tool of choice here, we can perform a hunt across all of our enrolled clients. Uh, so every machine that we have enrolled uh, in Velociraptor and search for that hash on disk, right? And if it's found, um, I'll show you here some other magic in just a minute, we can then perform additional actions either through N8N or the EDR tool itself. And these hash hunts right here, really used or i'm sorry utilized by the execute command node so what we're doing here is it's actually just executing a local command a local python client uh, to go off and perform that call and i'm going to talk more about that and get in detail in just a minute with kind of a, an example implementation of, of what i put together everybody get so far everybody follow along good okay awesome all right so tying it all together, um, a while back, and this is, I think, uh, kind of how Hershel and I uh, started talking, I uh, put together an article about using um, Security NN with the Hive, a free and open source platform, or I'm sorry, a free and open platform. Uh, they've kind of changed their licensing model now, but for case uh, management and incident management, uh, N8N and Velociraptor. Uh, to each kind of take on the role of that, uh, you know, that data platform uh, with the intrusion detection system, uh, the log management, the automation case management and EDR platform. So it's really an article put together to kind of walk you through how to set all this up together. And I call it SOAR Lab just because it's security and, uh, you know, with automation and response, it's, it's not necessarily you know, a complete SOAR, but uh, you can check out those links there. And what I'm going to do next is just kind of walk through a couple of those components that are in there. So the overall workflow is going to be that, you know, we see an interesting alert in security and then we create a case for that alert. 
And then we have a platform called Elastalert running, which is going to be pulling itself those that data in security in. And it's going to tell us whenever an observable or an IOC is added to a case in security in. And then from there, it's going to hit that N8N webhook and go through that workflow I described earlier. And this link down here is going to be an example of that workflow that you can implement along with this SOAR lab resources on GitHub. So going into a little bit more, uh, here's an example of a case that was created from an alert in security ending. So what happened here was a file was extracted out of the network stream and analyzed by a tool called Strelka. And what Strelka did was it applied a Yara to the rule, or I'm sorry, to the file. And then it detected that it was indeed a malicious batch file. And then it created an alert in security ending. And then from there, we escalated to a case inside of security ending, we created a case from that alert. And then we created an observable here from that event. So this file, it had an MD5 hash. Yes, I know MD5 is not obviously not the best of hashes for files, but uh, for academic purposes, we'll use it here. Um, so we had the MD5 hash here from the event that was related to that file. And that file was called poker.bat. It was a batch file that was detected. And then we've added an observable in security and in to associate it to that case that we created. And when we did that, what happened was an elast alert rule uh, was going off and it was perusing the data. It was checking to see if there were any new observables added to a case. And then once there was, it went off and hit the N8N webhook right here. And then once it hits that webhook, what's going to happen is um, obviously it's going to receive the notification and then it's going to go through, it's going to hit that switch node. It's going to see that it's a hash. Uh, I know this is empty here, maybe not the best example, but uh, it's going to see that it's a hash. So it's going to move on to that execute command node. And what is going to happen here is what I mentioned before was it's going to execute that local Python client. And then it's going to start a hunt in Velociraptor for this hash across all endpoints. Right. So now what we're doing is we're we're taking you know, some automation from N8N and we're also doing some other components from other platforms, right? We don't necessarily have to do everything through N8N. We could separately call each, uh, you know, call the hunt and then the hunt results and do everything else. But for our purpose, we're just gonna call the hunt and then it's gonna go hunt for that data. And what Velociraptor has is these things called artifacts which, enca which encapsulate expert knowledge and it's gonna go off and actually perform that action and perform that hunt. So we can see that it's going off and it's looking on the local endpoint. It's performing a query for that particular hash. And it did find that file and that hash on an endpoint. And what it's going to do here is once it finds it, this particular artifact here is actually going to check and say, are there any completed flows that, you know, completed successfully, basically? And, you know, do they meet this criteria? Were they executed by security and in? And did they have uh, this particular artifact, uh, regular expression in there. Uh, and it's going to say, if so, then if there are results, then I need to quarantine this host. So then it executes this Windows remediation quarantine here, uh, which is going to basically put that endpoint into a quarantine status to where we can go investigate it manually with Velociraptor or do other, uh, perform other response actions, right? So again, we could call out, we could call the quarantine artifacts or action from and if we wanted to manually, but sometimes it's just best to utilize, you know, certain components of platforms that work best and just, you know, maybe use N8N as the glue to get there and then uh, and go from there, right? It just depends on your use case. So uh, again, we've basically taken that observable data that we found from that alert and security in it. And we've taken it all the way through N8N. It's use Velociraptor and its API to execute a hunt across maybe a thousand endpoints and then automatically quarantined all of those hosts, right? And then if we want to go off and send an additional notification from there saying that all of these endpoints were quarantined, we can certainly do that as well. But if you want to check that out in more detail, I'll stop rambling and, and you can go off and watch that in your own time later. Um, there is a video on YouTube there, an example video about how to set all that up. Um, I will mention that we do not use the Hive anymore in security and so uh, it would be without this Hive component here. And I will be rewriting that particular article and putting up a new video very soon. 
to address that. But um, you know, if you do have questions or you do have an interest in that, please let me know. Uh, other than that, I think that is all that I have. And uh, you know, if you want to ask any questions on Twitter, please feel free to reach out to uh, the real Debbie Lambert. Or uh, if you want to check out that code, please be sure to check out my GitHub there, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have in the Q and A and uh, elsewhere. So thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wes, for yeah. sharing this. I can see already people are finding this really useful and they are going to uh, try out anytime in the security SecOps space if they haven't. So thank you once again for sharing this. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. Now, you might have interacted with our next speaker. So it might be on the community forum, on Discord, or on Twitter. So J Jason today has uh, probably used an attend for almost everything I can share. And uh, today he is gonna talk about how you can create automation and still keep your checkout teams sane. So take it over, Jason. I, okay. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen. Listen, you might not uh, now be able to do it. There we go. All right. And I'll even share my camera because wouldn't be a any day in session if I didn't have my Hawaiian shirt on. So I'm just gonna share my screen if I can find the right one. Uh, there we are. All right, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. Yep. Uh, so um, today, going to be a little bit of a different presentation than what I typically do. Usually I come on here and show you some crazy thing I've done in NADN. Uh, but we're going to focus a little bit more because we're talking about security today. Uh, focus a little bit more on how you set up and uh, configure your NADN workflows in order to make sure that you don't break security policies, uh, make sure that you can keep your uh, SecOps team sane by making their lives easier. And uh, we're gonna do that by using um, using the uh, using service accounts within NADN. So I guess right off the bat, you know, what is a service account? Um, we, we don't necessarily hear about service accounts uh, all the time. Uh, quite often that's a new concept to people. So I figured we'll spend a couple of minutes just kind of talking a little bit more about what the service account is. So service accounts are actually a, uh, they're a special account for non-interactive processes, which guess what? That's what NNN is. Um, what you do is you uh, set up these accounts so that um, when you are doing different work and so on, this is the account that's being used. Um, it's actually a commonly seen on most server-based operating systems. Um, so Windows, Linux, Mac, um, all these different systems have these service accounts built into them. And uh, so if you've ever run an Apache server, you might have run across the www-data service account. So that's the account that's being used for um, running all the Apache servers and, and everything in behind the scenes. So. Right now, let's talk about how most no-code, low-code systems work with credentials. Uh, so typically what you'll do is you'll go in and um, you'll use your unique credentials to access the platform. So you'll log in with your account. But then once you get into the platform, um, they ask you to do something which has always kind of thrown up a red flag for me. They ask you to give your personal credentials to access all the other systems. So if you want to access your mail account, you want to access your, um, your, your Google Drive, what have you, it's always asked you for your personal account. And that's always kind of made me nervous. I, I, I tend to be a nervous person when it comes to stuff like that. Um, and uh, often that's in the form of like a third party um, uh, authorization. So you're handing over your, the, the keys to your Google account or your Facebook account, for example. And, uh, so when I look at that, I'm going, hmm, you know, do I really trust this platform? All right, is it just me or has Jason frozen for everyone else as well? 
Ah, uh, all right, okay. Uh, all right, never mind. Uh, while Jason joins us back again, let's go ahead. And I have a lot of other questions uh, to ask you. Now, earlier I asked you questions around sports and video games. Well, now it's a question that I, I think I might have asked you, but times have changed and. I think it was the first community meetup that we did. So what is, you know, the app that you use kind of every day or you feel like you cannot live without? You mean excluding N A N, right? <laughs> yep, excluding N A N. We got Slack, we got Notion, we got Spreadsheet. Spreadsheet is pretty important. We got Coda, Nextcloud, Notion, okay. I think Notion is winning this round. Let's see if we got more Notion folks. Life code, that's a new one for me. I'm just gonna Google that after the meetup. We got Tinder, we got Coda and Canva, all right. Uh, Figma, Zeppelin, interesting, huh? These are some interesting apps and I am familiar with most of them. So I, I really like the choices that we have over here. And Jason is back. Uh, Jason, just giving you the permissions. You're good to go. My apologies, folks. Um, I don't know if you've heard the old joke about how do you determine the uh, best mechanic in town? You look for the one with the worst car. Uh, that's kind of what just happened to me. My, I've been having trouble with my computer lately and it just decides to reboot whenever it wants to. And uh, I've just been so busy working with any to end workflows and stuff that I haven't had time to fix my own computer. So anyway, let's get back to where we left off. Um, so I just finished talking about how, you know, handing over my personal credentials and so on kind of stresses me out a little bit when it comes to, um, to doing, uh, some of the stuff within a lot of these no-code platforms. And so I, I thought to myself, well, there's got to be a better way to do this. And um, because really when you take a look at, at how we do it now, you know, there's really no differentiation between the uh, user and the automation. And because there's no differentiation, all kinds of problems come up. So first of all, you've got no independent control of your automation. Your, your automation is always doing things as the user. And so there's really no, no way to control it independently. Um, second, you kind of relinquish your control to the automation itself. So that, you know, if the automation wants to do something uh, as me, I really can't stop it unless I have to go in and, and start working with the automation itself. It's also pretty much impossible to audit the automation. You know, if um, the automation looks like me and behaves like me and acts like me, it is me. And so if I have the SecOps team going in and trying to figure out what happened you know, to my account or what happened to uh, uh, something, you know, my email's missing, they have no way of knowing if I deleted an email or the automation. And then finally, again, I kind of alluded to this earlier, um, though you can't uh, disable the automation from your side. You have to go into the automation itself and, and stop it. Because if you do, uh, you're gonna be stuck with disabling your own account. So for example, if you're using your email credentials in the automation and it's you know sending off random emails to people, the only way that you can stop it without having access to the automation itself is to disable your own email account. And that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So this is where the service accounts come in. Um, my recommendation is that whenever you can create a separate service account for your automation, so I will often create an N8N account uh, where, when I'm doing stuff. I will create an automations account um, for the um, the startup that I'm I'm uh, I'm working with. Um, you know, we have an account called Oasis, and that's our automation account. And so we know that whenever we see this account, we see this information popping up. We know that this is an automation doing this. Um, so it gives us a, a, a bunch of things. And the big part of it is around that it isolates the automation from the user. Um, so you can independently control the automation uh, you know, from the user. You can 
disable the account, enable the account, and it's not going to have any effect on your personal account. Uh, secondly, you, uh, the user maintains control of his own account. So it's not like stuff's going to be happening under your name. It's all completely isolated. Um, the automations are very easily auditable because you'll have a different account name showing up as performing the different actions within the system. And uh, finally, I, if, the, if an automation goes rogue or, or something happens that shouldn't be happening, um, it will very quickly be able to go and disable that account and stop it from doing things, even if you don't have access to the N8N um, uh, dashboard or, or any of the other N8N processes. So how do you set up service accounts for N8N? Um, it, <laughs> it really varies depending upon what platform you're going to be uh, going in and working with. So let's take a use case here, uh, just to kind of give you guys an example. So uh, you're consulting to a business and that business wants to, um, you to have the ability to read their calendar information uh, from NAN to see people's availability. They're using the G suite of, of um, systems. So normally what you would do is you'd get that person's credentials and go in and access their, their uh, uh, in information from their calendar. Two challenges come up for that. So one, what if you have a company of a hundred people? Getting 100 people to come in to NADN, put in all their credentials, set up all that information, especially with Google, because Google can be a challenge with all the different pieces that they need to do with the Google Console. Um, it's, you're easily looking at a couple of hours per person. And that's a pretty long project. Now, mind you, if you're billing, that might not be a bad thing, but um, you may get some questions on your invoice. If you create an NADN account, within G Suite for accessing the calendars, then all you need to do is set up that N8N account, and then all the users can share their calendars with that N8N automation account. And then they've got the ability to look at different people's accounts, look at their, their uh, calendars, whether they're busy, what's available, so on and so forth. Um, for other systems, so going away from G Suite, what you might be able to do is create a separate account for them all together, and in, if you don't need to share information, but just access it, then you control the permissions. So HubSpot, for example, uh, you would go in, create the account in HubSpot, and then HubSpot uh, would give any end the ability to access what it needs based on the roles that it has. Uh, so to summarize, you keep independent control uh, um, of the automation from, over, from the user. You, the user maintains control of his own account. The automation's actions are easily auditable and the automation can be stopped from the, uh, the user or the automation side. It's really the big advantages that you get from the service account. And with that, we're open to some questions or maybe I'll just pass it over to Harshal and uh, we'll kind of keep on with the rest of the, uh, of the event here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing this. Uh, like this small tips, uh, can make a lot of difference and we don't realize that. So thank you, uh, you know, for sharing these tips and helping us realize how important such small things can be. All right, uh, moving to uh, the Q and A part. Folks, again, if you have any questions, just pop it up in the chat and I am gonna ask our speakers all your questions. All right, uh, the first question is, how can we get hold of the logo? Is it for sale somewhere? And a follow up, uh, a similar question to that is I want the light up and it and logo behind herself. So, is there an STL file available? Max, what do you think? So, firstly, that's a very big compliment. Um, thank you very much. Um, when we made that sign, we made a one off. We didn't expect that someone would run a door in their house with it. Um, but on that note, um, some of you maybe saw some teas about the NADN rebrand. I'm going to be a, a bit stum there, but um, there is one coming. Uh, I guess we've talked about it before. Um, as part of that, we are looking at exciting things we could do with swag. We get a lot of requests on this. Um, I can imagine 3D light up and end signs won't be on the MVP list of that. Um, but if you do want them, keep keep asking for them because uh, interest is going to be what's going to turn that from an idea to something that gets shipped to your house. So that's what I'll say on that. Wonderful. Uh, on a more serious topic, uh, someone had a question on what 
is the purpose of the public API? So can you share a couple of use cases where the public API can be really useful? Absolutely. So I think the, the immediate one, if we think about NNN embedders, people who are using NNN in their own product, is to programmatically create users, right? You've got hundreds of users. You obviously don't want to be doing that manually. That would be one way. Um, from there, I think that the nice thing about APIs is it's, you know, we're giving you the toolbox to do anything you like. So some of the use cases that we've talked about with users are things like programmatically creating workflows. So you have some sort of template, you're making some sort of changes um, and you can uh, you should be able to, to crud those workflows, right? Create, read, update, and delete them. Um, and other things could be things like activating, deactivating workflows, um, potentially cred, credential management, that sort of thing. Um, in my mind, I see there's a lot of sort of syncing between um, instances and that sort of thing. So really, I would, you know, position to, to all of our users, what are you going to do with it? Um, you know, we, we have use cases that we've modeled and whatnot, but assume um, they'll come out in tranches, but assume any sort of top level entity we have in NNN and in, in, in the midterm, we will have coverage for that. So if you think about entities, credentials, workflows, um, community node packages, you know, envision that you'll be able to create, read, update, and delete those, all the sorts of things you would do with a REST API, um, and let your imagination run wild and please tell us what you're going to do with it so we can ensure that that um, case is supported in, in future versions if it's not from the first one. Fantastic. And talking about uh, community nodes, we have a question over here. Uh, can we create custom nodes and share with the community? If yes, what is the process or what would the process look like? Sure. So, you know, today, custom node packages are, are something that's possible, right? So you could theoretically post it on the forum somewhere and, and someone could basically have to go through a manual process to, to install that, get their hands dirty. With the community node repo, that's the, the exact intention is to have a sort of a, a home for these places. And the reason why I say home is, you know, it's, it's, it has a network effect, right? It's going to be more valuable the more that it is a centralized repo with all these amazing nodes and everyone's publishing to there. So um, when that feature is being released, we will have documentation how to do this. As a bit of a teaser on that, we're going to be leveraging um, NPM keywords. So there'll be a prefix in the name that you have to put in there. That's just a requirement already of NNN. You'll add the keyword that we're going to use for this. Um, so then what we'll be able to use is serve people NPM views with that keyword pre-populated. So they just see a list um, of all these nodes. So there will be docs when that's ready to come out. What I would say is if you already have something in a custom node package, the prep work is going to be very minimal. You're basically going to be um, npm has this package.json, has a bit of metadata in there if you have a readme, that kind of stuff. It's going to probably take um, a short session to get that ready and publish it. That's amazing. Uh, and you also showed how you know people can use this custom nodes. Uh, in any time, uh, but would that also allow us to install NPM packages or, it is, or is it just for the nodes? Sure, so um, at the moment, the, this functionality will be for community node packages themselves. Um, a bit of context on that, if we open it up, you know, the more flexible features, the more cases we have, the more edge cases we have, and the more complicated the feature gets. So we made a conscious decision to, to limit it to community node workflows right now so we can focus and make sure that there's a high quality v1 feature and roll that out um i assume uh, in future you know on the roadmap especially if it's something that's requested by users we could use some of the underlying functionality we have to build for this to allow um, generally installing npm packages through the ui so if that's something you want to do check in the forum if there's someone's already asked for that upvote it if not create that and upvote it um, right now will just be community node packages so it's going to do a quick check that the, the name's correct and whatnot. And we will have a block list, which we don't really intend to use too much, but it'll be in the, in the background there if there's ever anything malicious that's known in the community as a sort of a initial defense so that you don't uh, inadvertently install that. It's a really nice way to segment to the next question, which is what is the process that you define which platform is eligible to be a part of an edit and node? Just clarify the question, Marshall. Uh, so I am assuming they're asking, you know, how do we make sure like which node becomes a native node in NNN 
mm-hmm. and which node remains as a community node. Sure. So when it comes to, as you can imagine, there's a few different sources where we're getting requests. Let's say there's some that even come from different internal stakeholders, various community. You know, we have a forum. That's a big one. So generally how we prioritize these is we try to take a data-based approach. Um, One of my colleagues, Niv, is doing some great work on organizing that. I believe there's some edit and workflows involved also potentially in in, in making that happen. But so we're gathering all this data and just like you prioritize most things, it's the impact, the effort and these sorts of things. I would say there's no rubric for what would and wouldn't be allowed as a node. I think the great thing about it at end is a community member built something that, you know, some um, closed source product wouldn't deem worthy on their roadmap for a few years. If it's high quality, it meets our UX standards, you know, we'll merge that in. Um, so we'd say there's no hard criteria on what types of services we'll accept um, other than the node itself has to meet um, various criteria in terms of quality. Now, one thing I would say us internally talk about is, is we need to do a bit of a better job at communicating what that is. There's various efforts on that. So you can expect that that will be more transparent, etc. But again, our big push right now is the community node repo. So we have um, give our community the opportunity to be posting a node somewhere, people using them, getting value from that as we shore up a little bit the official process for node submission, communicating how we expect that a sort of a native in a node should look and feel. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Max, for answering the questions. I think those were all the questions I had for you. Uh, Wes, I have a question for you. Uh, which is the most common threat that you think everyone should automate? Sure. So um, this one I didn't actually demo because um, I guess the others tied in. A little better with the other with the project but uh like phishing email right like business email compromise um it's probably one of the largest right so um either analysis like proactive analysis of emails um you know or, or like automating the submission of those emails to sandboxes or or whatever um something like that uh, something around phishing and uh business email compromise gotcha thank you so much for answering that well, I'll say one more. I'll add on ransomware yeah. as well because they're you know they're they're kind of hand in hand. Uh, so ransomware and, and and business email compromise. Yep. Awesome, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and I got last question for Jason. Is Jason still in the call? Uh, I think he is restarting his machine. No worries. Uh, in the meantime, uh. I think Max has some announcements to make. Uh, and while we get, have get Jason back on the call, let's Max, I want to take it over. Thanks very much, Harshal. Um, so soon our gracious host, Harshal, um, will be leaving NN as he takes on some new and exciting challenges. Um, and on behalf of everyone here at NN, I'd like to thank you for being so passionate about the product, about what you do, and about our community. Um, when talking with Harshal about this, this change, I asked him what achievements he was most proud of with his time here. And I like this question as I think it sort of the answers you receive really paint a picture of a person's character. He mentioned he um, was really proud of helping community members on the forums, creating educational content, and hosting meetups. And I can say those activities absolutely had a meaningful impact on so many community members. Um, And from Harshal's answers, I think it's it's clear to me that he thoroughly intrinsically enjoys helping others. That's an amazing quality um, to have, and I'm sure you're going to make a lot more people smile in your next role, Harshal. Um, So Harshal, thank you so much for your hard work, nurturing our community, and, and truly from the bottom of my heart, good luck in this next chapter. We all are rooting for you and excited to see what you do next. Um, so on that note, I'd like to introduce uh, Emma, one of our new joiners. She's gonna be our new community manager. She's gonna be taking the torch from Harshal and I wanna assure everyone that you're in very good hands. 
Yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's lovely to uh, just start in the meetup and with such really amazing talks. Um, thank you also for our intro, Max. Um, yeah, really great talks today as well from Max, Jason and Wes. Um, really hyped about the updates as well, especially the community node repo. And um, yeah, I'm the new community manager at NAN. So maybe just a bit about me, <laughs> a quick introduction. Um, yeah, and just some things I'm excited about. Um, you know, I'm originally from England. I lived in Germany now for eight years. Uh, I started my career many years ago as like an avid community member myself with a lot of like motivation to share my ideas and uh, yeah, to be a community builder as well. And kind of from that hobby, I initiated my career in community management, uh, initially in the gaming industry, uh, which I felt was a lot of fun until I discovered open source developer communities. And um, yeah, I was working with a framework for building contextual chatbots. And um, I would just say the community was uh, a lot less covert than gaming communities. And uh, since then, I haven't really looked back. Um, yeah, I just, I, I just wanted to share maybe some of the things why, or why I find uh, developer communities so cool. Uh, I really love how eager folks are to kind of learn from each other, experiment, like push limits uh, of like making extraordinary projects, uh, like the sense of fellowship amongst other developers, like to collaborate and build stuff together and share knowledge in general. And uh, yeah, and just some things maybe that I want to share to, that I want to ensure that, uh, you know, we continue. And that's really just like recognizing, rewarding all of these really great technical and support contributions. Um, maybe also recognition involves uh, sending a neon signs <laughs> at some point. Um, but yeah, that also, um, there are also like things like um, that our platform remains a really great place for meaningful discussion and maintaining that great connection that you already have um, with any and team here that um, Harshal's done a great job to mediate. And uh, yeah, with all that being said, I really look forward to getting to know all of you through our channels and events and initiatives that we all share together and just continuing with the great work of Hashel and everyone here. So yeah, <laughs> thank you so much and to really look forward to the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I, I honestly don't have a lot of stuff to see, a lot of stuff to say. Like I am almost <laughs> out of words, but thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let's just continue uh, and go ahead with the meetup. Uh, Jason, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what, uh, if he's going to join us or not, but he had a really cool giveaway. So I am going to check in with Jason uh, and see, you know, if he can do it async. But uh, Emma, let's maybe continue with the networking session. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, I will start to host the breakout rooms. Uh, we have around 35 folks, so about 11 rooms. Let's do uh, one second. Um... So I guess a good maybe icebreaker for folks as well, maybe while I just set this up in case you struggle to find something to start with. I think it's cool maybe to, to mention something like a current workflow that you're working on. Um, and for example, I'm working on something that will also acknowledge the achievements of members in the forum. So stay tuned for that. And now I will actually automatically assign the breakout rooms. There we go. And open all the rooms, <laughs> first time. <laughs> All right, so the folks who are doing it for the first time, you might now get a pop-up on your screen that is gonna ask you to join a room. Just go ahead and click on the join button and you would be automatically uh, paired up with someone from the community and you can go ahead and have a chat with them and you know, just go and build your network and make new friends. Thank you, Hasha. I will move folks that are alone here 